Now Psalm 119 verses 9 to 16 has that Hebrew word Beth written above it. And each line of this second stanza of Psalm 119 begins with the Hebrew letter Beth. Sandy, can you show that to us please? And Beth also means house. Like in the Hebrew language you have Beth Sida. Means the house of Sida. You have Bethlehem. Means the house. Beth of Lehem. Lehem in, in Hebrew. You have to go back one, one Sandy. Um, so Bethlehem means the house. Beth of Lehem. And Lehem in Hebrew means bread. So Bethlehem means the house of bread. A house is a place of safety and a place of growing up, isn't it? Some have suggested that this section tells us how to make our heart a house for the Word of God. Now the Hebrews, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, they love to um, make use of of um, symbols and symbolism and therefore they they tell us and we read that in the in the writings that the letter bet that we have there that's this the sign or the symbol for the letter bet um, in our bibles um, actually kind of looks like a house with a foundation and walls there and a roof and an opening here and that's why they come to the suggestion that this passage is actually telling us how to make our heart the house for the word of God in our lives. Now the psalmist has confirmed in that first stanza, verses 1 to 8, that it is always a blessed thing to walk according to the law of the Lord. A blessed thing to seek Him with all your heart. But it's also a difficult thing. Which was why he ended that stanza with a cry for help. That the Lord would be with him, next to him, and not forsake him on that journey of steadfastly keeping his decrees. Verse 8, read like this. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. The Beth stanza starts at the next logical point of the psalmist journey. The Lord wants His children to fully obey His precepts. We've read that in verse 4 already. You've laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Now the psalmist asks this. How am I going to do this? How am I going to stay faithful on this path of purity? Now the psalmist refers to himself as a young person here. A person on the verge of maturity. And we know what powerful drives and urges threaten to control a young person. Especially today with the internet. But biologically their bodies change which leads to mood swings and impulsiveness. Yes? I can see a few parents not. Socially they want to be accepted at all costs. They will even compromise to be popular. Intellectually they begin to question everything in life. Even God. They need a lot of guidance in that stage of their lives. This is spiritually true as well. And the young psalmist acknowledged here. That he needed direction and understanding and guidance and wisdom. To handle life's temptations and pressures, growing pains and opposition that he experienced. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he mentions eight principles to apply in his heart. Or that he will apply in his heart and that we can take note of. That we can apply in our hearts to help him grow and stay steadfastly on God's path of purity. Here's the first principle that he mentions. Verse 9. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. Principle 1. 
live according to God's word. The word of God alone can keep you on a road that is pleasing to God. A road that keeps you pure in His sight. With all His traffic signs. Stop. Don't steal. Don't lie. Watch out for, uh, for all the temptations of, the, of this world. If God's word is in the house, so to speak, in the heart, you will live a lifestyle defined by it. A lifestyle that is guided and directed and formed by His Word. And the young Daniel is a good example here. We read that the 15, 16 year old Daniel, when he was asked to eat the food that um, came from the king's table, food that were offered to pagan gods, we read the following in Daniel 1 verse 8. This was his response. He, re he refused it. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Daniel 1 verse 8. He resolved, we read. He deliberately chose not to be defiled by food offered to pagan gods. But what guided his choice? Was he a vegetarian? No. God's word guided his choice. God's laws about unclean food guided his choice and informed him. Joseph is another example. He became the head servant in the household of Potiphar in Egypt. He was a handsome young fellow, we read. We read, Potiphar's wife loved handsome young fellows. So she tried to seduce Joseph. But he ran from that temptation. He wanted to stay pure. What guided his decision? He knew in his heart that it is a sin against God. To lay with a woman who is not your wife or before you get married. Genesis 39 verse 9. God's word had set up house in both these young men's hearts. And they could stay on the path of purity because they lived according to God's word. Yes, principle number two, verse 10. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. So, what is the psalmist's advice? How can we stay on God's path of purity? Seek God and God's word with all your heart. Now, when you see, what you seek with all your heart is a reflection of how spiritually mature you are. If it is primarily money, power, popularity, even health, you are spiritually immature because you seek temporary worldly stuff to satisfy you. Now I'm not saying you should not aspire to be someone in life or to make something of your life or to live a healthy life, what I'm saying is this, to first seek the kingdom of God with all your heart. Now we've already identified the type of heart we're talking about when we look at that Aleph stanza. We're talking about the new spirit-filled heart of a believer in Jesus Christ. Such a heart seeks God first. And will therefore want to handle money in a way that glorifies our Creator God. Will handle power in a senior position at work in a way that magnifies our omnipotent God. Will manage His family in a way that gives God, our Father, joy. A mature, spiritual believer in Christ who has God's laws in his heart, in his house, 
will seek to stay on God's path all the time, will seek to manage his or her life according to God's design, and will seek not to stray from God's commands. Because he knows if he strays from it, he will find himself in a most dangerous territory, a territory where choices are governed by sinful desires and passions, and not God's good commands. Here King David is maybe the, the best example to come to mind. He understood this well. And if he wrote Psalm 119, we can understand why he has pointed this out in verse 10. That you have to seek the Lord with all your heart and not stray from his commands. Because he saw Bathsheba that day outside. He on the rooftop she was bathing and he desired her. And he gave in to temptation and he strayed from God's commands. He became an adulterer. When, when he heard that she was pregnant he became a murderer. Killing her husband. And then a little baby boy was born. And in the end, that he was very sick. And that's the little boy. And the little baby. And he lost that, that child. And intimacy and peace in his relationship with God and with others were broken. The prophet Nathan had to come to him and point this out to him. If the psalm writer was David, we can understand completely why he would urge the reader to seek God's word with all his heart and not stray from it. Because he spoke from experience. As a person who strayed terribly and suffered the unblessedness of not walking according to the law of the Lord. So, dear brother and sister, be committed to God's word. Let it set up house in your heart. Because that is how you barricade yourself against straying from the Lord's path. Principle 3 in verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here's the principle. To stay on God's path of purity. Heed God's word in your heart. So that you might not sin. Now the word hid in Hebrew means obviously to hide something. To conceal but to protect something of great value. And to keep it safe. We understand that. We, we know that we should not leave our laptops lying on the back seat of our cars in town. We know that because the laptop is a very um, important and valuable item to us. We don't let it lie around for everybody to take. And similarly, with regards to the most valuable and most precious word of God, you have to protect it and cherish it in your heart. Do not ignore it. Do not trample on it. Do not be flippant about it. Don't let it lay on the shelves of your heart and just get dust on it, collecting dust. It is God's precious gift to hold on to and to keep close to you in the most intimate part of who you are, your heart. So give it priority above all so that you will not sin against God. In the Old Testament Hebrew mind, the word heart, figuratively used, referred to the center of your being, the center of your intellect, emotions, will, and even personality. So where must, where must we heed? Where must we cherish we must be, we treasure God's word if he, we, we read that it should be in our hearts, in our entire being, in our entire thinking, in our entire planning. What does God want me to do? What is the wisest way according to his word, staying within the principles and laws of his word, 
forward in my life. In our doing, in our feeling, in our speaking, in our loving and caring and enjoying. Our whole being must be saturated with God's word. And your heart in all of this is like the command center. From which all your decisions and your passions and your actions and your desires flow. So what is in your heart will therefore determine what you value. And how you live. And how we interact with the world. And the psalmist tells us that you should make sure that God's word, His commands are there. Safe and protected, valued at all cost, to pilot every step you take, to guide you away from sin towards holiness. Now how do we get God's word there? We need to learn it. Verse 12, praise be to you Lord, teach me your decrees. That's principle four. Learn God's unchange, unchangeable decrees. Now the, the word, uh, decrees is a translation of the Hebrew word hukim. It is spelled H-U-Q-Q-I-M. The Hebrew word means to engrave or to carve, to write, to fix, to determine. So God's decrees are then His unchangeable laws. The unchangeable will of God. It's permanent, like an engraving. It's fixed, like a tattoo. You cannot delete it. You cannot ghost it. You cannot change it. You cannot just swipe it away like an unwanted image on a smartphone. It is permanent and eternal. And the writer thanks God here for his unchangeable, eternal and good decrees and laws in life. And he begs the Lord to teach him in order for him to understand it and apply it and grow in it. And teaching is needed when we have the word of God. Teaching is needed for spiritual growth. On God's path of purity, His road of sanctification, making us more and more like Jesus Christ. And our God-given textbook is God's Word, the Bible. Verse 9, we live according to His Word. Verse 10 to 11, we seek it and we hid it in our heart. But we need to understand it in order to apply it. If this does not happen, it's like you knowing the Pythagoras theorem of the right angled triangle, those who know the maths a bit. And you can give it and quote it anywhere you go, but you don't know how to use it and you cannot build bridges, bridges and tallest buildings by using that theorem, that most important theorem. Without sitting under sound teaching of God's word to help us understand his decrees and to apply it in our lives, there will be very little growth in terms of spiritual maturity. Where does this happen for the believer? Well, we spoke about our house, the heart. This happens in God's house, metaphorically speaking. The church, the local church. That's where your heart should get engraved with the perfect and eternal decrees of God. We do it through the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Principle number five that the writer gives us. Verse 13. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. Have you picked up the young person's progression since verse 9. He lived according to God's word, verse 9, sought it in verse 10, found it and hid it in his heart, sat under its teaching in verse 12, and now here in verse 13, he cannot keep quiet about God and his laws. 
And laws here refers to moral laws. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not kill. His heart is so full of the word of God and his right and good laws, his wonderful ways and the beauty of God's will that it is it just flowed from him like a tsunami. The psalmist is telling us that if God's word is in your heart, your house from which you operate life, if you are taught God's decrees, you will share it. Your lips will recount it. Your life will show it. You will be a wonderful fragrance for the gospel in any company. And in his case, the writer's case, you will speak up against sinful behavior and evil as he did. The spiritual mature person, my dear brother and sister, sister will not join a monastery. They will shout from their rooftops the works of God, His good moral laws, His good news to societies and nations and His own family and rejoice in following it and living according to it. Even if it means persecution, like He did for our psalmist here. Principle 6 in verse 14. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Now back to the image of the home, the house. The home should be a safe place, right? It should be a place of learning for our children and growing up. But it should also be a happy place. You want your children always to desire to come back to your house. Now the world rejoices in material riches and power and popularity and how many ticks they can get for a video about emptying an ice bucket on their head. That's where they seek happiness. That's their treasure. But the psalmist says there is a much bigger treasure to rejoice in. If you have that treasure, you will rejoice a bazillion times more than the guy who won the biggest lottery in the world. Why? Because your treasure is a bazillion times more significant and valuable. What is it? It is God's statutes, he tells us. Statutes in Hebrew is, is the Hebrew word edut. E-D-U-T. And it refers to a witness or a testimony. The tablets with the Ten Commandments on it and the Ark of the Covenant, they were called testimonies. Referring to the immutable witness, the binding proof of it, a testimony of God's covenant relationship with His people. Like you would draw up a contract with somebody today and you get it signed and legal and official and binding. Those things were testimonies or proof of God's eternal loyalty to His word and promises. And He's the only one who signed it. So to speak. He keeps it. And that's why the writer rejoices in God's statutes. It is eternal. It is solid. And God will uphold them. Which means that you can trust in them. You can follow them without wavering. It is indeed a great treasure to have. What makes it so valuable? Well, it comes from God, first of all, and is therefore eternal and trustworthy, as I've said, and perfect to guide you in faith and in life. But listen to this. God's word alone directs you onto the pure paths of God. That's what the writer stated there in that, first verse, uh, that, that verse 9. It alone lives in your heart and keeps you from sin and straying onto worldly paths of destruction. It alone satisfies and teaches your soul. It alone is therefore worthy to rejoice in and share with the world. But have you picked up that the psalmist uses the word following there? I rejoice in following your statutes. Action is 
implied here. This is not just teaching your children to recount the Ten Commandments and think that is it. That will keep them good. It is absolutely important for them to know that. We've picked that up already. But what he's saying here is, I rejoice in following God's statutes, in obeying them, in keeping them. It means, as you follow God's laws and ways, as you walk in His path that He lays out for us in His Word, as you are controlled by and formed by His Word, as you do these things, you find joy. True joy is experienced as you follow, while you walk in God's decrees. This joy is not like that glazed cherry on a cupcake which is there just for the beauty of it. No, it is experienced as you eat it. As you eat the cake itself, as you follow God's statutes. Otherwise, it is just that, like that glazed cherry on the cupcake. Here's principle 7, verse 15. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. Principle 7, meditate upon God's precepts. Precepts is the he comes from the Hebrew word pikudim. Um, you spell it P-I-Q-Q. U D I M Pikudim. And in Hebrew it means appoint. It refers to what God appoints, appointed us to do, what He expects us to do. The Lord laid down certain ways of living that He expects us to follow. In marriage, in parenting, parenting, in worship. Precepts, therefore, has a very personal denotion. Which is why if you follow that word right through Psalm 119, you will pick up that the writer says very personal things about it. He guards it. He loves it. He chooses it. He longs for it. He seeks it. He rejoices in it. And here, he meditates on it. Now the Hebrew word translated here as meditate is an interesting one. It refers to the sound of a harp. You know what a harp is? That David played. A harp softly playing in the background. It's there all the time. It's not a heavy metal rock guitar that blows your eardrums out. It's there all the time. And you're aware of it all the time. And it affects you all the time. When I got to this part, it reminds me of, of when you go out to, to have a, 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 a nice meal at a good place and enjoy it. You, when you come to a really good restaurant, what you will find there normally, if you listen to the music, is the soft music in the background. Why? Because they want you to stay there and enjoy the meal. When you go to a place like Spur, you have country music and upbeat music and rap and rock and roll. Why? Because they want you to leave so that the next guy can come in and they can feed them. It is really true. But we are talking here about God's precepts. The sound of that guitar or piano playing softly in the background. Re regarding God's precepts then, to meditate on them means... To be aware of it all the time. And to think deeply about it. To consider it all the time in your mind. To be affected and influenced by it all the time. To let it constantly play in the background of your thoughts. Like that harp of David. God's precepts is the music that should be playing in our hearts. Our houses. All the time. Affecting us, guiding us all the time. What is normally playing in our heads? Normally we str struggle to keep the planning of our jobs out of our minds. 
or kids they need to be dropped off here they need to be picked up there we need to transfer money for them, for them there we need to get that visa for them here we, we need, all these things are going on in our minds issues with friends this guy um, didn't tick me on my whatsapp uh, message or oh, this guy didn't like something that I shared on Instagram and you think about what's wrong what, what did I do wrong or our budget oh no there's not enough money this this month for this or for that. How am I going to get clothes for my kids at school? How am I going to pay my transport bill? And these things are playing in our minds all the time. And you know what? They affect us too. We might become depressed. We might become anxious. And feel as if we are drowning in the worries of this world. And the psalm writer was there. He was laid low in dust, we read. He was depressed. He was anxious. He cried. He was scared of those persecuting him. His advice for his readers is this. Let God's word constantly play in your heart. Be very attentive to it. Listen to it. Tune your heart's ear to it. Let it hum in your heart all the time. Influencing you all the time. Instead of having all these other things buzzing around like bees in your head. Get God's word there first. Listen to it. Let it hum there all the time. His last principle that he gives us, principle 8, in verse 16. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. So principle 8 is this. Delight in God's decrees. If you look at my condition, you will pick up that good food makes me happy. Right? You cannot miss it. My family and I um, love to watch Master Chef, Master Chef Australia. And many times you will hear a judge say something like this. Oh, this food gives me happy thoughts. Or I can eat this all day long. Or you know what? This dish is heaven on a plate. My dear brother and sister... When you eat the word of God, when you meditate on it and extract all its nutritious spiritual parts for your life, when you consider it and think deeply about it, when you let it constantly hum in your heart, you will delight in it more and more and the world and its temptations will grow strangely dim and dull. How can living according to God's word give you that kind of delight? I mean, I don't see people around delighting in the, in the word of the Lord. I don't see kids in my classroom reading God's word all the time and delighting in his word. Uh, I, don't, I, can't, I don't stand in Nathan's row and see people delighting in the word of God all the time there. Just the opposite. So how can living according to God's word bring about this delight? Good question. Valid question. It does. Because you have been given a new heart. With new appetites. A heart, a new heart that loves Jesus. Trusts Jesus. And not in the things of this world. A new heart given to you by the Holy Spirit. Who moves you to seek. God, seek His Word and heed it and keep it and cherish it and be satisfied by it in your heart and to find joy in it. A new heart has been given you with a new appetite. An appetite for God. An appetite for His Word. Satisfy that appetite. Feed it with God's Word. And the new heart goes yippee. Hallelujah. Just the food I need. Just the food I can rejoice in. 
And it will delight in eating God's word, in living according to God's word, seeking it, cherishing it, meditating on it, talking about it to other people, about the perfect and all satisfying soul food of God's word, because you want them to have it as well. I delight in your decrees, the psalm writer writes. And that's why he could say that. So, here's a question. Do you find joy in following Jesus and following his decrees? Don't answer me out loud. Answer that to yourself. We all need to ask us this question. Do I find joy in following Jesus and following his decrees? If you say yes. The psalmist says, in that last part of verse 16, Good. Now go and do not neglect God's word. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for your amazing word. Thank you, Lord, that it is the only food that satisfies our souls. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us a new heart to rejoice in your word, to be fit and to grow when we hear God's word and explain it and apply it in our lives. Oh, Lord, I pray that you guide us in this, that you be the one next to us, a Holy Spirit, to remind us of, of your word, to bring it to our minds, to let it hum softly all the time in our minds and hearts so that we can be attentive to it in everything we plan and do. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.